So today, everyone read the poem. It's called The Gift. Um, we're just going to take a minute for Cora to read the poem slowly in front of everyone, and then I'll copy the big question on the board. As uh, before you uh, start, Cora, I'd just like to introduce Dr. Sophie Hiratuni and Gordon in the back there. Uh, she's here to observe the interpretive discussion. For those of you who were in my class last year, we did um, a number of these interpretive discussions, so this is where, where I learned all of my skills. And where are you doing? <laughs> okay. Um, the Gift by Lee Young Lee. To pull the metal splinter from my palm, my father recited a story in a low voice. I watched his lovely face and not the blade. Before the story ended, he'd removed the iron sliver I thought I'd die from. I can't remember the tale, but hear his voice still, a well of dark water, a prayer, and I recall his hands, two measures of tenderness he laid against my face, the flames of discipline he raised above my head. Had you entered that afternoon, you would have thought you saw a man planting something in a boy's palm, a silver tear, a tiny flame. Had you followed that boy, you would have arrived here, where I bend over my wife's right hand. Look how I shave her thumbnail down, so carefully she feels no pain. Watch as I lift the splinter out. I was seven when my father took my hand like this, and I did not hold that shard between my fingers and think, metal that will bury me, christen it little assassin or going deep for my heart. And I did not lift up my wound and cry, death visited here. I did what a child does when he's given something to keep. I kissed my father. Okay, so for our big question today, you can just take a moment to think. We said in line 35, when the author states, I kissed my father, was this kiss giving out of obligation or appreciation for the actions of his father? So you can take a moment to think about that. And anyone who's ready, we can start. So overall, in the, in the poem, I think that um, all the like, paragraphs are they're they're emphasizing how the, the tenderness of the father. Like uh, in, the, in the second paragraph, you clearly see, clearly see, uh, see his loveliness for the for the child, and uh, in, the, in the third paragraph, and she's stating that she's uh, imitating her father, uh, his father, his father's action. So uh, from all the context, I think that he is really appreciating his father's action mm -hmm. here because uh, he, she's so tender, he's so kind. And so for me, I think it's, it's an appreciation instead of a So exactly like which lines are you um, looking at when you say in that stanza? Um, like in the line 10, to measure of tenderness, he laid against my face. So it's really some something warm going on here. And see that, that he's really appreciating his actions. Does anyone else want to add on to that or maybe has an idea? You could take this one, Cora. <laughs> okay, um, Zoe? Um, in line 12, right after Leo is reading, um, the flames of discipline, um, that definitely makes him feel like um, the child was obliged to kiss his father because um, I'm sensing sort of a um, parent-child relationship that the parent has um, a lot of discipline and that if the child were not to respect his parent by you know, kissing him, then you know, the flames, that seems like he would have been disciplined if he had not um, been respectful of his father. Um, so I'm getting that it's more of like an obligation than appreciation um, from lines 33 and 34. I did what a child does when he's given something to keep. So I take that kind of as like, it's, you know, it's what a child does. It's their obligation to kiss their father when they're like given something, you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like if someone gives you something, you say thank you, you know what I mean? So I'm kind of getting this like obligation like I did what a child does yeah oh, sorry um 
the last stanza is something that really confused me when I first read it, but I think in the light of this basic question, it actually makes a lot of sense to me. Um, where he's saying all these things he doesn't do, as if he expected that he'd do them. Um, so, like, he didn't, like, look at the Shard of Metal and say, this is the thing that was going to kill me. He didn't name it the thing he was, that was going to kill him. Um, so, he doesn't, he's not looking at it in a romantic way. He's not looking at this thing and seeing it as this fatal thing that would have killed him had it not been his father, for his father. Which makes it almost seem, like, routine that it was there. Like... Yeah, it, it wasn't going to kill me because my daddy's there. Um, and so I'm not sure if that, um, I'm not sure where that leads to this basic, or where that leads to in terms of this basic question. I think it could go either way, say that he belittled the father's action, therefore it's our obligation, or he realizes that because of his father, he no longer sees this metal shard as the thing that's going to kill him, therefore it's appreciation for the father. So I think it could go either way using that evidence, but it's good evidence nonetheless. So basically you're saying for that part, it almost like, I guess you're kind of getting to a point that you're kind of pointing out the relationship in a way. Is that sort yeah. of what you're saying? Yeah. And because of that, we're able to see the appreciation that he has for his father. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have a big point. I think it's appreciation and my point starts at from all the way up with line A. And with line A, I sort of get that it's sort of peaceful and tranquility. Because when you think of dark water and prayers, and like prayers over dark water, it's sort of a peaceful, tranquil feeling. So what I get with that whole stanza there is that he's giving this peaceful, tranquil feeling, and these are peaceful, tranquil things that's being done. So it's what his father's doing with his hands, this sort of peace. And um, then I move on to line 19 and 20, and 17, and the tiny flame is like, he's being letting it be hold, so it's like a flame that does not burn. And then 19 and 20 is sort of like where he bends over his wife's right hand. So I feel that it's sort of like the gift is patience and love passed on. Like that is what the gift is. Mm -hmm. So now you're interpreting the gift. Yeah, so... Um, I'm just a little bit confused about the correlation between lines 17 and lines 19 and 20. Yeah. yeah um, I kind of feel when the flame that burned, it was sort of, he was giving him something that could have hurt him, but it was the love and the patience that kept it from hurting. And so he... And with 24 and 25, it showed that his father gave him this gift because he was seven when my father took my hand like this. So he goes on to treat his wife carefully. So his father's love shows him this. So I think when he, in 35 and 34, when he's giving something to keep and he gives his father, he kind of, his appreciation that he's given this love and patience not that he's given this splinter heat but that he's given this way of living more like so if you bring it back to the big question so you're saying your answer would be appreciation because it kind of ties into the gift that he's given that you interpreted it as what did you say your interpretation for the gift was tenderness yeah. pa patience, patience. Tenderness. And so, because of that, that's sort of why he appreciates his father. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyone? Uh, Morgan. Um, so, I'm just trying to juggle, like, I'm trying to figure out what his relationship with his father is and how he feels about his father. Because in line, well, it's like the end of seven and eight, 
um, a well of dark water, a prayer. I'm really like stuck on this line because when you think of dark, there, dark always has a negative connotation with it, but a prayer, that can be positive, like as in a prayer, he's trying to help himself or he is in a bad situation and he wants it to get better because that's usually why people pray. Um, or he um, like is thankful, I don't know. I feel like a prayer can mean a few different things. Um, so I'm trying to like juggle like what his actual relationship with his father is because in line five, um, it's like he removed the iron silver I thought I'd die from. And I mean, that's pretty much saying that like he almost saved him. So I don't really know um, if he is like, how he feels towards his father. Like if he is um, appreciating him or if he's like almost upset or like thinks of his father in a negative way. So now it kind of seems like we're trying to figure out the relationship. Yes. Of the parent, so. <clears throat> and how does the relationship correlate to this obligation or appreciation? And so anyone want to try to rest? Oh, yeah. Kind of, um, when I was reading, I felt like his father was kind of mentoring him in, in the way, kind of. Like, when he was, when on line 24, when he said that when he, when he, like, got the spoon removed from his finger, he was seven years old. I kind of started thinking of our work with Scarlet, with Scarlet Letter, and I kind of started thinking about Pearl, who was seven during most of the story. And I kind of thought, like, and I started thinking about, like, her character, and, like, she's not really a tender person. She's kind of, like, wild and rambunctious. And it feels like in this, like, in this moment when his father is pulling the splinter out of his finger, he's kind of, like, seeing this, like, soft, like, tenderness from his father. And, like, when it said that had you followed that boy, you would have arrived here. Like, it feels like he learned how to do this over time. But, like, when he grew older and, like, his wife was in the same situation, he, like, learned from his father how to be patient and how to be tender and how to, like, like remove this, like, small splinter without, like, hurting her. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Mm. Oh, yeah. Um. So I do think that he has some. Uh, there is some tenderness and some uh, good relationship with you. And his father because he's pretty uh, positive that he's uh, definitely like leaving his father. Like he gave his uh, he gave his this fatal splinter in his hand to, for his father to, to remove. And also and also words he's using like lovely face. Can you say the lines? Your normal flower, please. Okay. The uh, in the line two, beside the story in a low voice. In line three, I watch his lovely face, but not the blade. That was in, uh, in, uh, in the line um, uh, nine and ten, and I recall his hand to measure of tenderness. And you, you see all the lines. He's, he, there's there's no lines in this poem, which is repelling. You, you did not see the repelling sense over here. So if if he's not repelling, he's leaving his father to let him uh, deal with this fatal wound he's uh, he has in his palm. Then. I think it, it, he definitely has a good relationship with his father. Okay, so basically, I see what you're saying. So, you're saying like in the poem, there isn't really a like situation or a part where he's kind of like pushing his father away. It's almost like he just kind of. Would you say? Are you saying like he kind of goes with the flow, or he's just like he's believing like, his father, believing he's, him? Yeah, he's okay. letting him deal with it. So that's an interesting point there. Um, I was looking at the um, kind of parallel between his father taking the splinter out of his hand and him taking the splinter out of his wife's hand. Um, and I noticed when he's taking it out of his wife's hand, it makes no mention of a story, whereas that's the focus of when the father takes the splinter out. And then on line six, um, it, he says he can't remember the tale that his father told. Um, so I guess... In neither scenario do the um, people with the splinter actually feel the pain, but there's different methods of taking the splinter out. Um, I guess 
because it has to do with um maybe the kid didn't appreciate it like when he was having a splinter taken out he wasn't thinking about how amazing it was that he wasn't feeling any pain he was just thinking about his father's soothing voice and how he was distracted whereas when he takes it out of his wife's hand he doesn't focus on distracting her he focuses on uh, doing it carefully so that even though she's not distracted there's no pain to focus on um, so I guess the difference in the way they does in the way they do that kind of um, implies that the uh, kiss was for obligation because he didn't really take in his father's methods because when he it, when it comes down to it when he has to perform the same action he does it in a different way um, so I'm just thinking, I'm trying to discern the obligation from the appreciation, and throughout the poem it goes back and forth, you know, it could be either or. Um, from lines 10 to 13, two measures of tenderness he laid against my face, the flames of discipline he raised above my head. That both shows um, appreciation and obligation. And then lines uh, 33 to 34, I did what a child does when he's given something to keep. That could be either obligation or appreciation. So then I thought, let me just propose a question here. Could the child have an obligation to be appreciative? So is it both? Is there? Is it not an either or, but is it both things? Okay. So what I am understanding his question is that from my perspective, I think the difference between uh, we uh, we distinguish between obligation and uh, appreciation over here is whether the, the appreciation there's slightest appreciation really exists because when we talk talk about his kissing his father purely because of the obligation, there shall not be a real appreciation mixed in with the obligation. Otherwise, it becomes truly an obligation. Because uh, it becomes truly an appreciation because that obligation is is encouraging you to do something despite whether you want to do it or not but when it comes to an appreciation it's that your feeling that is motivating you to do the stuff when when about obligation was mixed in with the appreciation the appreciate the, the motivation of the, the appreciation which became the main drive of the action so so then it turns into an appreciation so I think I can justify that uh, this father is kissing father, this child is kissing father for appreciate, appreciation just by proving that there is actually the slightest appreciation in his heart. So basically, um, if everyone understood, so just make sure I'm getting this right, you're basically saying there can never be an obligation to appreciate because when you appreciate something, you're doing it on your own actions and obligation is sort of, it's not really your choice. It's kind of like an expectation in a way. Yeah, so that's the reason why I said it's our yeah. appreciation behavior. Okay. So, um, so um, I was trying to like go back to, like to the what Morgan said about um, the relationship uh, between the the father and the son, and. Um, and I think I think they have a good relationship because um, in line three, um, he says his lovely face, you know, pertaining to his dad. And then um, talking about line seven and eight about the stark water and the prayer, um, I think of that more as like you know if you look if you look into a well and like into the dark water like there's no end. It's almost like you're like in a trance like trying to find that but you can't. Like it's almost it's almost like it says, like a prayer in a way. Like it's, it's so. I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. Um, contrasts. Is that what you're trying to get at? Is that their stark contrasts? Is that what you're trying to explain? Like, to know? <laughs> um, yeah, like it's, it's like it's more. It's like a trance in a way. You know what I mean? Like you can't. If you look into a well of dark water, you can't find the bottom. You're almost looking for the bottom. Um, and then I kind of got to like, um, like this appreciation and obligation thing. Um, I think now that I look back at it, I think he feels appreciation um, when he's pulling out the splinter um, uh, from his wife when he says, um, 
So you're telling us, say, here I've been over my way from line 20 going yeah. into 21. Yeah, 22. so that little section there, like, I feel like he feels appreciation. Like, she doesn't feel any pain thanks to his dad, what he did when he was seven. Um, but I think the obligation comes in in the last line when he says he kissed his father um, because that's what a child does. You know what I mean? I have a question. I'm sorry. So the part where you said where for line 20 to 22 where you say you said he feels appreciation for what he's doing for his life. Um, I'm not sure he if feels, I he feels appreciation for like what his dad did for him. By the actions that he's like right here that he's doing with his wife. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it makes it clear. Like uh, he feels appreciation that he can make his wife feel no pain because of what his dad when, did when he was seven. He took his hand, like, in 25, he's using the same method, like, he took, um, they took, wait, took my hand like this, you know what I mean? So, I think it's a mixture. Does everyone else agree, or anyone disagrees with that? Oh, Bridget? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I've been um, wrestling a lot with who the father is um, in order for me to understand whether or not it was appreciation or obligation. Um, for starters, I, um, I like with those lines seven and eight that Todd and Oregon brought up, um, a wall of dark water of prayer. When I read this the second time last night, I said those were peaceful and holy things because. For me, when I look into nature or water, and it's like it's it's dark water, so it looks dark blue, and that's like very like serene and like holy for me. And um, I connected these. These are deep things. Like a prayer isn't anything light, and this water that uh, this dark water is deep. So I got these as things that are that are ethereal and like holy. So. <laughs> Um, so I was wrestling with whether or not um, this father is like an actual person, you know, like whether I, I think the father is God and I'm trying to, I have a couple examples of how I can support it, but um, I also wanted, uh, okay, let me support it, with um, the, uh, uh, where is that, oh, with uh, lines um, 14 through 16, um, had you entered that afternoon you would have thought that you saw a man planting something in a boy's palm. Um, thought, I thought was very, like it was like an essential word because it may not have been that. Um, and uh, so that's that's another thing that can support me thinking that the father is another little father. It's probably like, like in um, Scarlet Letter, uh, they say father of, what's the word? Like, of, like holy father, like instead of, Pearl having like a man as a father, a heavenly father. She has God as her, uh, her father. Um, and here I think the speaker um, has is mentored by uh, this heavenly father. And uh, also on, on a line uh, 29, um, he says, christen it, little assassin. When you christen things, you make it holy. Like when you're like baptized, you take away the evilness. Um, and you bring it into the kingdom of holiness and stuff. And that brings me to whether or not um, it was a appreciation or obligation because it made me think about um, religion and how uh, like people feel like it's like their obligation to do things because it's um, part of who they are because it's their religion. Um, but I think that in I think I should now change my mind that I think it's obligation because sorry I think while I talk <laughs> I think it's obligation because look at the lines 21 through 25 um, somebody said that he didn't recite it and how and I was thinking about how not reciting these holy things how not reciting this deep uh, prayer um, changes um, how we look at uh, the speaker's wife, um, her uh, experience in getting the splinter taken out, like how 
how different was her experience because she didn't have this prayer said to her and she didn't feel this um feel this deep experience um you know i think that if you feel like you're you have to do something it changes the way you look at it and changes the way you do it like if you really want to do something you would do it like in a way that will um, procure like the best experience but um through 21 through 25 it wasn't like it, it seemed like uh, the speaker was obligated to do it so he or she left out the most important part to, uh, for me which is um this prayer this dark water image Okay, so first let's interpret what Bridget said a little bit. <laughs> Bridget just like, we always have a shift, I know this interpretive discussion. Um, so now our new big idea is who is the father? Because I know it's, um, remember, we have to keep in mind, we still have the big question. Now we're trying to figure out the relationship, and we're now we're trying to figure out who the father is. And well, so I feel like another question just arose out of what you said, which is, is there obligation or appreciation in the father? Like that's what I'm hearing from what you just said. Is is that what I'm getting? Is that right? Or like, do you does not? the father feel obligated or appreciated to do it? I think the father is obliged to do it. Like he was more than happy to do it, but he did it out of the kindness kindness of his heart. And I think that's what brings the. So what, what lines can we say, like, the father did it out oh, of Oh, the first two lines. To pull the metal splinter from my palm, my father recited. Um, I noticed that the, the word choice, um, to pull, I, I, uh, I wrote down in order to, uh, in order to pull the metal splinter from my palm, my father recited. And I thought it was interesting that the speaker didn't say while he pulled the metal splinter out of my palm. Did it? it made me think that this recital was essential in order to have this experience that was, you know, otherworldly and special um, to procure an experience where he had the least amount of pain or no pain at all. Okay. So, oh, well, Tommy has this look. All right. Speaking of derailing biblical metaphors, prepare yourself. <laughs> so, a while back, I thought, hmm, what is this metal sliver thing? I started thinking of all the things that could create metal slivers. And I thought, hmm, well, a nail's a metal sliver. And then I looked at the first line, pulled the metal splinter from my palm. Nail in the hand, that's Jesus. Oh so, okay, there's more. So, line seven through eight, a, a well of dark water, a prayer, is referring to God, calm, tender, loving father figure. Uh, lines 12 through 13, Flames of discipline above my head. The threat of hell. Uh, lines 16 through 17. Uh, planting something in a boy's palm. A silver, a silver uh, tear. A tiny flame. This is God's threat of hell. Uh, so what do you interpret um, what is line that, what 17? Is all, this? Uh, all of that. No, line 17 itself. How do you interpret that? I don't know what the, whatever he's planting in, in his hand is. Uh, some message, perhaps? Uh, one more piece of evidence. Uh, did not hold that shard between my uh, fingers and think metal that will bury me, all that. Did not instead of didn't implies that what follows is true. So this uh, 20, uh, 26. And I did not hold that chart between my, or 26 onwards uh, and think metal that will bury me, Christmas little assassin, or going deep for my heart. Did not, instead of didn't, says to me that whatever happened afterwards, or whatever he says that, that he didn't think happened after, afterwards, actually happened. So this little metal thing that he's holding is the metal that we're, they'll bury him, is his little assassin. Which makes sense in, if you refer back to the beginning. Little splinter in the hand is him nailed to the cross. Now what does all of this mean? I don't know. This is just what I got off of ten minutes of thinking, what if the speaker's Jesus? So this is a big idea. That is that um, um, oh who has it? He has it. Okay, um, looking after what Tommy said and everything from 31 until the end, it is very biblical because when God told Jesus and everything, like, 
don't, you're dying for their sins and everything, Jesus was okay with it. And sort of um, saying that he, it says that I did not lift up my wound and cry death visit here. And sort of that Jesus was okay with dying and not like blaming God for doing this to him and everything. It was just like he would thank God for allowing him to wipe away original sin and sort of like get rid of the evilness and everything, you know, and sort of forgive all of humanity. So with this new... With this new idea, how exactly, I guess, like, does this tie in with, like, how we were talking about the wife? And mm. then it's... How does... Oh, well, uh, well Cora. I mean, how does this... Pardon me. Uh, oh, I just have to say this. I don't really think the metal splinter is actually a metal splinter. Like, I was looking at this a while ago, and I was thinking, I think it's something mental. I don't think he was anything to do with metal or anything. I think it was something in his heart that was hurting him. And that he, like I got this from six, seven, and eight. I think whoever the father was, was telling him some sort of story, so like some advice that was a tale. And, but the advice wasn't really what mattered. It was someone who was helping him and soothe the dark water, which was the anguish and that and the prayer was the help that came and the healing. So I think that was it was basically he was helping him with mental anguish, not physical anguish. Oh just so you guys know we have like five minutes and then Dr. Sophie wants to talk about stuff. So anyone who hasn't spoken yet or has spoken very sparsely, like now is the time bring forth your efforts. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. So when people started talking about that line with um, a well of dark water of prayer, I started really thinking about it and I kind of started thinking that it was like a metaphor for faith in a way. Because like when you're looking at like t like what Tatiana was saying, when you're looking into a well of dark water, you can't really, you can't really see what's in there. And you kind of like have to and like you can't really see the end of it and like when you're praying like for example say you're suffering and then you pray to god like you don't really see the end to your suffering you just have to have faith that god will like um bring an end to your suffering and like that's kind of what the boy does with his father like like um in the last stanza when he's like when he's like looking at his finger he doesn't think like oh my god i'm gonna die from this he just has faith that his father is going to bring an end to his suffering and like you kind of see that it's kind of like a teachable moment for him. So like when he grows up and like his wife is in that same situation, he does like the exact same thing his father did for him. That's pretty good. It's a pretty one. I think this whole poem is kind of about him. Once he grows up, you kind of understand the tenderness that um, underlined the relationship between him and his father. And sure, there were times where his father had the flames of discipline, but he like when he's older he's reflecting on this one moment and he kind of sees like the pain that his father went to to ensure that he didn't feel the pain from the splinter to see how underneath all of that maybe at the time he was a child he didn't understand but there was this real like underlying tenderness and when he's older he can appreciate it and he can see it now and how he like the pains he goes to to ensure that his wife isn't hurt when he's trying to help her so I feel like that's a big part where you said when he was younger, there might have been a point where he didn't understand, like, exactly, like, what lines may you might see, like, the misunderstanding. I think it's the last stanza, really, when he's, you know, he's talking about he didn't pull that shard between my fingers and seeing my father bury me, and he says, I did what a child does, and he's given something to keep, I kiss my father. But there's not a lot of thought going into that. He just kind of, you know, he expects that to happen, but now that he's, that he's older and he... You know, it says, had you followed that boy, you would have arrived here where I bent over my wife's right hand. You see the mirrored actions to kind of show how his understanding deepens with age, and he kind of realizes that I think the love and the tenderness that sometimes isn't so obvious in a relationship. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, y'all. Yeah. All right. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, line 16 and 17 because I, I don't think anyone really interpreted that. Um, so I think the use of planting uh, tell the readers that the something that is planted will grow into something more significant. 
which is the flame in line 17. And I think flame is like a symbol for um, maturity and uh, more masculine and it's, it's a sense of toughness. So I think these two lines has a sense, have a sense of um, guidance. It's like the man, whoever he is, maybe the god or the real father, I don't know. So this man is like guide the boy to be tough and to be more, more um, maybe independent or something. So that, yes. And then the boy really learned from that. And then he just does the same thing to his wife. Um, how does that reflect on the obligation or appreciation? Um, I think between these lines, it's more um, appreciation because the boy is grateful for um, his father because his father guides him to be like a man instead of just a little boy who is afraid of a metal splinter. Okay, we kind of have to wrap it up, guys. Sorry. Oh, well, I, I can't. <laughs> so, anything to say? Yeah, um, really quick, Cora's okay. going to kind of go through the notes that we have um, from what I think we didn't really get to. Well, we kind of actually did answer the big question in a couple ways, but then we arose so many others. Okay, so, uh, so in terms of the question itself, I feel like as a class we're leaning more towards appreciation. However, as uh, Doug highlighted, these lines can be really interpreted either way. So it really depends on how we believe that the appreciation is. And I think kind of like what Sabrina said at the end, kind of I felt like that was echoed throughout the rest of what people were saying, how they, I think that after that kind of like solidified for me that other people might have been thinking that, um, you know, at first he might have thought of it as an obligation between him and the father, but then it, it turned into appreciation. In terms of Jesus, we established that um, the splinters may or may not have been nails, and there may or may not have been lots of biblical images in this poem. Um, I'm not really sure how that plays out with appreciation or obligation, but <laughs> you know, that was Jesus, actually cool so. just to point out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now Dr. Sage. Okay, so great. Well, thank you very much. I don't want to take a lot of time here, but I want to ask all of you, um, how did you like this discussion? Uh, I, I, I mean, yeah, good. Raise your hand and make a comment, okay? Um, you don't have to all nod. And I know that's hard because you got the two leaders sitting right here, but I think it's really, really important to have these honest reflections about what happened and did you like it and what, if you did, what did you like or what, what could have helped? All right, so, so yes, please. I'm sorry I don't know your names. I'm just. I'm Bridget. Bridget, okay. okay. Um, I liked it, but um, this is just my problem with uh, reading and talking about poems. I feel like there's never enough time to get to anything because poems like like this and like several other poems we did last year can mean so many different things. And I feel like as a whole group, we throw out a lot of intriguing ideas and that if we had maybe, let's say, a day to talk <laughs> about it, we could all connect our like ideas together to really wrestle with it. OK, very good. Yes, we were trying to just um, you are. Yeah. What? Your, uh, your name. Dorian. Dorian. Um, okay. I'm Dorian. Um, these discussions are really good for like learning who you are as like a reader and stuff. Because I find um, like my first comment really came to pointing out a couple lines and not really finding the meaning in them, um, and really saying, well, it could go either way. Um, and I think that really says to me that um, sometimes I can be very um indecisive and I can uh try not to uh, pick favorites or something. Um, so they're actually really good about um, having a, a person learn about themselves. Okay, other comments? Yes. Uh, so I'm Leo. Leo. And uh, I know that the freedom is what required for the, like, uh, the discussion with the poem, but at some point I think we are going too far beyond like I mean, I mean, this is a, this man is a Chinese, and he's he's born in Indonesia, and his fa his father is a physician who is a close 
uh, who is close uh, physician with Mao. And I, I don't think the, in that in, uh, political environment that his father is going to be anything near a Christianity. So uh, I don't think the, the, his religion is going to be a huge player over here. And we're, I, I think we're just going too far beyond at some point. Okay. Any, any other comment that they want to make? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that sometimes I think we have um, too many ideas thrown out there and we never have enough time to go. Okay. So one of the things you want to do is to try to, you throw out ideas, but you want to try to, are they, are they defensible? I mean, and, and I think that you know that you need to defend them and you are extremely, I mean, you're, this is an extremely impressive discussion from my point of view. You know that, but you have to live it. You have to really take the time. You can't just go through 10 lines quickly and say, yeah, yeah this is evidence for this case, for this claim. Okay, so, so living with the evidence in a way that helps you then put to the side maybe some claims that are not as defensible, which is not to say you shouldn't throw the claims out there, but you're going to have to build the argument. I think you know that, and I think spending more time, you know, patiently looking at a couple of lines instead of trying to do 20 of them um, will help you feel like you've done a more convincing job mm -hmm. of, of putting things to the side. All right, now, what did you notice about the way in which the discussion focused? Did you feel like there was a question that you shared that you stuck with, that you continued to try to work on? No? Yes? Um, I'm working. working. And I think it started in that way, and uh -huh. then it just kind of veered off track. Like, the first few comments were, were like obligation or appreciation, and then after we were trying to like figure out um, like why he was appreciative or why he felt obligated, that's when it's kind of just like drifted off and people were just like, paying attention to the minor, minor details of um, like the poem instead of the basic question. So. Well, but that's, that's how you look at the basic question, right? You have to go back to the details of the poem. So, uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I think that, you know, from my point of view, I really, I think this was admirable from the point of view of, you really did have, were presented with a clear question with two options, and you spent a lot of time trying to, I can't tell you exactly how many minutes, but uh, trying, to, trying to decide, well, are these lines supporting this position or this position? So you weren't trying to figure out what is the question we're talking about. You had it. That's the hard work they did. That's what they put in front of you. That's a goal. That's a huge goal for the leader, and they, I think, achieved that goal beautifully. So you should be very proud. However, I agree with you that, you know, one can go on, you know, saying, okay, well, we have evidence for this and this and this position, but why would he have felt appreciation? Okay, so now we, now we move the question, okay? And that can happen. That's okay in the discussion, right? So you got to have to, you're going to have to work with, you know, okay, I got to, and to have, have the sense that, yeah, now we're on a different question that's slightly different, and how are we going to manage that one? That's all stuff you can keep track of. So I, I, I think you, there's nothing, from what I can see, there's nothing wrong there, but building the case, building the case is always the bottom line here. Throwing out the ideas, yes, but building the case to support your claim, that's what you have to work on. And I think you've done a terrific, terrific job, and I, I congratulate your teachers. I do, and all of you, I really, it's very moving for me to hear you do this. I think it's, I think it's amazing. I do think that you, you were worrying about participation, which you should have been, and you got a big group here. To get all these people talking at least three times, which is always my personal goal, that's very hard to do, right? So encouraging them. You can use queuing, by the way. I didn't see you do any of that. In other words, four people raise their hand, and you pick one of them. You don't have to do that. You can say, okay, in the order that you see them go up, you know, first Morgan, then blah, 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 and list them off, and go in that order then they all know they're going to speak. And uh, it, there's some there are issues doing that. I mean, there can be some problems. But in general, it, it relieves the tension in the room because then they feel like, OK, I'll have my chance. Well, there's a lot more I could say, but except congratulations to every one of you. Just keep it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. When you 
are hearing changes. Today? You heard some people, oh, yeah. you know, changing their mind. And sometimes she even said it. Bridget even said, oh, I think I'm changing my mind. I think it was Bridget who said I've changed my mind, which is good. But they don't always do that. Sometimes you can hear it. And you have to try to say back to them what you're hearing. You did a great job of trying to do it, Erica. I mean, I, I really, I, I, I congratulate you. This is very impressive. But you can, I mean, this is an unending process to develop these skills and trying to listen to what people are saying that goes beyond what they themselves can hear is part of the job of the leader. And in one case, you had somebody, I'd love to give you this example. Um, there, someone argued that this guy, this, this, the speaker in the poem, did not really appreciate the father because he used a different method from oh, the father. Dorian. Dorian. Okay, but I couldn't see who it was. Okay, he used a different method, which says, you know, he didn't tell a story. He just, you know, did something else. To, um, so he didn't really appreciate it. Now, another person said something that was in conflict with that. At least that's what I heard. It was a little hard for me to, you know, but. Um, I, I, or, or change that position, um, reinterpreted those lines. Mm -hmm. And you, if, with a short poem like that, you're going to have a lot of that reinterpreting. That's what you started to get when Bridget was uh, got off under the Holy Father business. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're reinterpreting. And in those cases, you have to try to go back to a speaker. And you can be an active leader. It's not easy with your peers. You did such a good job. I hate to suggest anything that you didn't do, but you can help the discussion by going back to saying, wait, I hear you saying something different than what he said. Mm -hmm. And so letting, letting them reflect on what they said. Maybe you heard it wrong, you know, you don't know. But the point is that as a leader, that's the role, that is part of the role. So that helps them to hear better what they said and to see, is that really different from what this one said? It's just, especially when they're building arguments, mm -hmm. that's kind of a necessary thing to do. And you know, you you're on the right track, but just that's just something to think about and work mm -hmm. on as you go forward with this. But you see the clarity of that basic question that you saw the payoff. Look at all that sweat and work you put into it. Look at the payoff that you got. You know, she, she said. Oh, and then well, I we noticed got, we got a lot of old ideas that we started off with. But like that's what good. That's a good thing. Yeah. Isn't that great that you've already been there? Of course, uh, we kept looking at each other like, we said that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Isn't that exciting when that happens? Yeah. I mean, that's really something. I mean, you have really, you have really gotten into this in a, in a deep way. Mm -hmm. You'll never forget this. Either the experience or the preparation. And you can keep doing that. And as people have more experience, they will develop these, you know, more subtle skills, which you've already started to do very beautifully. Uh -huh. so, Thank you. Thank you so I'm much. really proud of you.